request all dignitaries to kindly take your seats on stage. A very good morning, everyone. Students, colleagues, Mahe officials, dignitaries, and our beloved chief guest, we have presently assembled with a mission at hand that is to commit to memory the working of a great mind as we open our hearts in memoriam, reminiscing the charismatic presence of the late veteran journalist Sri M. V. Kamath. Thereof, we presently begin with the invocation by Ms. Mandira. Saraswati Namastubhyam Varade Kamarupini Vidyarambam Karishyami Siddhir Bhavatu Me Sada He Sharade Daya Palisu E Badanu Bela Kagisu हे शारदे दया पालिसो ये बालनो बैड कागिसो नाले गड़ा दारियली नंबी के आने ले आगे रिसो मुन्नडे सो कहीं हिड़े दो नावाड़ो पद पद दल्लू Sanchari so Who will leave you no Goody cut the day no Near a limi no Adi mutta de no Adai vadad ne ne yalla no He sharade Daya pali so E bala no Bela kagi so हे शारदे थैंक यू मंदिरा श्री एम वी कामत हैज बीन द इंस्पिरेशन बिहाइंड अ नंबर ऑफ स्प्राइटली एंडीवर्स ऑलवेज वर्किंग टवर्ड्स द फाउंडेशनल इथोस ऑफ जर्नलिस्टिक प्रैक्टिस इन द स्लाइड we now pay homage to his holistic vision through the presentation of a floral tribute. I thereupon invite all the dignitaries on stage to kindly do the honors. Thank you. I now request Dr. Padmarani, Director MIC, to present the welcome and introductory remarks. Honorable Mrs. Malni Parthashadri, Chairperson of the Hindu Group Publishing, Pro Chancellor of Manipal Academy of Higher Education, Dr. H.S. Balal, Registrar Dr. Narayan Sabahit, University officials, media personnel, faculty, staff, and students from the various institutions of MAHE and MIC. A warm good morning to all of you. As director of Manipal Institute of Communication, it's my privilege to welcome each one of you for the eighth MV Kamath Endowment Lecture. Manipal Institute of Communication is a constituent unit of Manipal Academy of Higher Education and Institute of Eminence. Today, we have with us our esteemed chief guest, the chairperson, the Hindu group publishing, Mrs. Malni Parthashadri, to deliver the eighth MV Kamath Endowment Lecture. Mrs. Malni is a graduate in journalism from Columbia School of Journalism. After a brief stint at Washington Post, she joined the Hindu. She has dabbled in a number of fields like journalism, policy think tank, and administration. She has many firsts to her credits being a women journalist. She is one of the few women who have been at the helm of affairs in a media organization, especially the print media in India. A cordial welcome to you, ma'am, on behalf of MIC and the Mahe fraternity.
Pro Chancellor of Mahe, Dr. H. S. Balal, is a radio radiologist by training and profession. He is an administrator par excellence. He was Vice Chancellor of Mahe from 2003 to 2007. In 2007, he was appointed as the first Pro Chancellor of Mahe. He has been associated with the endowment lecture since its inception. It's our honor to welcome you, sir, Thanks. for this lecture. I deem it my pleasure to welcome Registrar Dr. Narayan Sabahit for this endowment lecture. He has over three decades of experience in teaching, research, consultancy in geotechnical engineering and administration. He was appointed as the Registrar of Mahe in 2015. A warm welcome to Pro Vice Chancellor Health Sciences, Dr. M. Venkatraya Prabhu. A warm welcome to all the university officials, heads of institution, friends from the media, faculty, staff, and students of Mahe and MIC. The endowment lecture was started in the memory of our honorary director, Dr. M. V. Kamath, Sri Madhav Vittal Kamath, M. V. K., and also properly addressed as Madhav by some of his close associates. Manipal Institute of Communication was the dream child of Kamath Sir. Since its inception in 1997, he remained actively associated with it till his death in 2014. MIC celebrates its silver anniversary this academic year. We've been consistently ranked among the top mass communication colleges in the country. We offer courses at different levels, undergraduate, postgraduate, PhD programs, also postgraduate diplomas and certificate courses. MIC started with only 19 students and one course in 1997. Today, we have 600 plus students and eight courses. M.B. Kamath was born at Udupi on 7 September 1921, and he passed away in October. And that's the reason we generally try to have the endowment lecture in the month of September and October to remember him. He had his early education in Udupi, Mangalore, and then moved on to Bombay. In Bombay, in 1946, is when he started his journalistic career with the Free Press Journal, and later on became the editor of the Free Press Journal. For the next 40 years, he worked in the field of journalism at different levels in different countries, influencing people wherever he went. In his journalistic career, there's no field which Mr. Kamath had not set his hand upon. He worked as the editor of the Sunday Times for two years, and then moved on to become the foreign correspondent at Bonn, Paris, and then the Washington correspondent for the Times of India for nearly a decade. This was a golden age in his career. From 1978 to 81, he worked as the editor of the then leading weekly magazine, Illustrated Weekly of India. He was also appointed as the chairman of the Prasar Bharti, and in 2004, he was conferred with Padma Bhushan. He wrote innumerable articles concerning political and social matters in famous newspapers. He was very much familiar to the readers of Udaiwani, a local Kannada newspaper where he wrote a Sunday column regularly. Even in his retired life, Mr. Kamath's hobby of writing continued on media, politics, and literature. He has written the history of various banks, like Corporation Bank, Syndicate Bank, and also two books on our Prime Minister, Mr. Narendra Modi. For years, he would be in his office at 8.45 AM, read his newspapers, answered his mails, wrote his columns, interacted with students, parents, and guests, and after a lunch break, again remained in office till he finished the work assigned for the day, which was usually till 5.30 PM. Such was his commitment to work that even the week he left for the heavenly abode, he had completed his columns for the week. He was a keen learner and a great storyteller. He could describe the scene at the gateway of India, the night when India attained her independence with the same zeal and enthusiasm 
year after year on the Independence Day celebrations of Mahe. And I think all of you who have been old timers in Manipal have had the privilege of listening to it both as students and as faculty. I personally was associated with MB Kamath at MIC. He was keen that all of us faculty uh, members and students travel abroad, visit universities, learn things from various places, and implement them here. He was constantly prudding us to publish as he wanted to see Mahe among the top universities in the world. It's not only the faculty and the students, but he was concerned about everybody around him. Mr. Kamath was known for his integrity as a journalist and his courage to call a spade a spade. I quote John Quincy Adams, if your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, you're a leader, unquote. Mr. M.B. Kamath was one such person. Ladies and gentlemen, we've gathered here today to remember and pay our respect to this great personality. In 2015, MIC started the endowment lecture in his memory a year after his death, and we have continued to have it every year and hope to keep his memory alive in the future. Once again, a warm welcome to each of one of you present for this lecture. Jai Hind. Thank you, ma'am. On behalf of MIC, I now request Dr. H.S. Balal, Pro-Chancellor Mahe, to share his fond memories of Sri M.V. Kamath. Our chief guest of today's program, Dr. Malini Parthasarthi, CEO of the reputed Hindu group of publications, the dynamic director of uh, Manipal Institute of Communications, Dr. Padmarani, our registrar, Dr. Narayan Sabait, distinguished invitees, members of the faculty of MIC, my dear students and members of the press and electronic media. Whatever I wanted to tell Padmarani has already mentioned, because I was supposed to speak about the biodata of M.V. Kamath, she has given in more great details. And also, she has given me just three minutes, from 11.07 to 11.10, isn't it? Uh, but anyway, I have prepared a big list here, notes, you know, but I am not going to read all that, you know, because it will definitely take more than three minutes. I am very happy to be part of this event, because uh, for the last eight years, this is the eighth edition of uh, M.V. Kamath Memorial Oration. M.V. Kamath was the second son of uh, Sri Vittal Kamath, who was a very prominent lawyer successful lawyer of Udupi. And uh, the good thing that he has done, he has donated two acres of land in Udupi, right in front of his house, to St. Sicily's College. You know, that was the best thing that he could do. That's what I thought, because providing education. It was mainly a girls' school, but of course, till fifth standard, they used to have co-ed, both boys and girls. My brother studied there. My wife was an old student of St. Sicily's Convent, which is a very famous school in Udupi, and also now they have become a junior college also. I, my father knew this family because his elder brother, N.V. Kamath, who was a lawyer himself, he was also a popular lawyer who succeeded his father. They used to live in Udupi. I am also from Udupi. And we knew each other in the sense our family, my father knew them very well. I have not seen Vital Kamath, but I have seen N.V. Kamath, M.V. Kamath's older brother, because he was in uh, Udupi practicing law. M.V. Kamath, as Padmarani said, after his early education at St. Sicily's, he went to Mumbai to pursue his uh, higher studies. He actually wanted to become a doctor, medical doctor, but uh, somehow he didn't get a seat. Then his next preference was pharmacy. So he did that and was practicing pharmacy for some time before, before he took into journalism. So he's a, he was a very popular uh, journalist, you know, as Padmarani said, he was a journalist, the editor of many reputed journals, both in India as well as uh, abroad. Then after that, he came and settled down in Mumbai, in car, at car in uh, Bombay. 
Pai family was very, very close to him. Even our founder, the late uh, Dr. T.M.A. Pai. As a matter of fact, indirectly, he was responsible for starting of Kasturba Medical College, KMC, the first self-financing medical college to be started in this country in 1953. See, what happened was, uh, Dr. A.V. Baliga was a very famous lawyer, or rather a surgeon at Mumbai those days, and he was related to Dr. T.M.A. Pai, our founder. So, Dr. Pai used to consult him regarding on in medical uh, colleges and all. When he got this fantastic idea of starting a private medical college in Manipal, he wanted to consult him. And at that time, when he went to meet him, he saw TM, the MV Kamath sitting outside his office waiting for, to meet him. So that time he told him, I believe you do me a favor because he was the correspondent of Times of India those days. Please give a small ad in the newspaper that I'm going to start a medical college. A private medical college will be started in Manipal. In the year 1953, this is. So M. V. Kamath did that. And uh, that, you know, attracted more than 500 applications, I'm telling you, 500 applications. And that, uh, see, encouraged him to start a medical college. Though, Dr. A. V. Baliga was very much against. He said, you are a bloody fool. How can you start a medical college? Because Manipal was not this Manipal at that time. It was a barren hilltop. See, medical college training, most of it happens in the hospital. We did not have a hospital those days. So where will you give the training? But he had fantastic idea. We were under Madras province those days. Our district was under Madras province. Government of Madras said we don't have money, but we will give you hospitals at Mangalore. Because Udupi was a small place with about 25 bed hospital at that time. And it was not a district also. Mangalore had a bigger hospital, general hospital called Venlock, and a women's and children hospital called Lady Goshen. So we used that so-called PPP, private public-private partnership, started in 1953. That was the brilliant idea of our founder, which our now government is trying to emulate. That's how the medical college has started. So it is not wrong to say that M.V. Kamath had a role in the starting of this uh, private medical college. So after he retired from his journalism, as I told you, he settled down in Mumbai, car in Mumbai. Ramdas Pai used to visit him very frequently. <coughs> During one of the visits, he said, I believe uh, I'm retired now. And about a year or six months before Ramdas Pai visited, it seems he fell ill and he had to be shifted to the hospital. But that flat didn't have a, a lift. So he had to be virtually carried in a chair. So Ramdas Pai said, uh, instead of all this, why can't you come to Manipal, where all the facilities of a uh, metro city is there, no traffic, good weather, very good pure air to breathe, why can't you come and settle down in Manipal? He agreed to that and then came and settled down in Manipal in 2004. From that year onwards, I knew Madhav Kamat or M.V. Kamat from very close quarters. Till then I didn't know, but he was associated with our university for a long period of time as board of management member and all. But after that I came very close to him, very close uh, association we had for about 10 years before he died in the year 2004, 14. He was a voracious reader, used to write a lot of things, you know, and he wrote more than 50 books. And he used to have this old typewriter those days to write the material which the company had stopped manufacturing those <laughs> days, you know. So he had two typewriters. So he used to typewrite, and the typewriter used to go out of order. He used to call me, Subhash Babu, I have a problem. I have become unemployed now. My typewriter <laughs> is out of stock. Now, please get it repaired immediately. Fortunately for us, there was a, a repairer in our MIT those days, repairing those typewriters. So I used to call him and tell him, do it immediately. Otherwise, I will get at least three, four, ten phone calls every day. So that's how it used to happen. So that's what M.V. Kamath was. We had a very close relationship. And in 1997, as Padma Rani said, MIC, which was his brainchild, it was started and he was continuing as the, as the honorary director of MIC till his uh, demise. One of his ambition or request was to start a language department in our university, which we were not able to do during his lifetime, but we started it after that, the language department, which he was very, very fond of. So in 2014, he died. 
we had a peaceful death. So after his death, we thought we should have a, an endowment lecture in his honor. And during the last seven years, we had seven very important people, some from journalism and some for other fields also. Actually, Vice President of India, MV Venkaya Naidu also was one of the guests, and Nirmala Sitaraman also was there, Finance Minister. And this is our eighth edition. We are very fortunate to have Dr. Malini Parthasarthi, boss of Hindu group. You know, Hindu is a very prestigious uh, newspaper, and we are from Madras uh, uh, province, you know. So our side, in the morning, if you see, people are old-timers. See, I'm from 20th century. This is all, your all 21st century products. You know. We are used to reading newspapers. Nowadays, I don't see any youngsters reading newspapers at all. They <laughs> go to, so print media have to think about it, how they can sell their products, you know. But uh, Hindu, everybody reads, and also my father always used to say, it is the most authentic newspaper, because many other newspapers, they highlight some of the things. But Hindu is the most authentic newspaper, and it used to give extensive coverage for sports and games activity, about which I am fond of. So we have a lot of respect for Hindu. And uh, the boss of Hindu is with us today, Dr. Malini Parthasarathy, to deliver the endowment lecture. A warm welcome to you, madam. We are happy that uh, you are here with us. Please go around the campus. She's on a very short visit. She was supposed to come yesterday and spend time with us. Yesterday night we were supposed to have dinner, but due to prior commitments, she has come this morning and going back in the evening, I am given to understand. Yeah, but anyway, whatever time you have, go around the campus and see for yourself what we do. Yeah, because seeing is believing. This is your first visit, you know. So we want people like you. See that, so that you can see the facility, seeing is building, as I said, so that we can showcase whatever we do. So because that, we feel, is the best way of advertising, word of mouth, rather than print media or television and all. With these few words, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I am very happy to be part of this uh, M.V. Kamath 8th Endowment Lecture. Thank you very much, Padma Rani and all the rest of MIC for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, sir. May I now invite Dr. Manjula, Associate Professor from the Department of Corporate Communication, to introduce the Chief Guest heralding the onset of this year's MV Kamath Memorial Endowment Lecture. Thank you, Anupa. Good morning to one and all present here. I'm deeply honored to be introducing our distinguished speaker for this year's MV Kamath Endowment Lecture, Dr. Malini Parthasarthi. Dr. Parthasarthi, is the chairperson of the Hindu Group Publishing since July 2020. She was formerly the editor of the Hindu newspaper, the group's influential flagship publication between 2013 and 2016. Earlier, she was the executive editor of the paper from 1996 to 2004. Prior to that, Dr. Parthasarthi was a special correspondent at the paper's National Bureau in New Delhi, reporting on political and international developments. Dr. Parthasarthi has been a political journalist for three decades and more, writing news stories and editorials on major themes in Indian politics, particularly on the rise of Hindu nationalism, the changing context of the Indian political landscape, including the decline of the Congress party as a flagship bearer, as a flag bearer of secular nationalism. In January 2013, when the public confidence in India's democratic institutions and political processes was at an all time low, she founded the Hindu Center for Politics and Public Policy, a think tank intended as a credible and independent platform for an exploration of ideas and public policies, the aim being the rebuilding of public faith in India's democratic process. The highlights of her journey as a reporter and editor includes a series of interviews with Indian Prime Ministers, Sri V.P. Singh, Sri Rajiv Gandhi, Sri P.V. Narasimha Rao, and Sri I.K. Gujral. She was the first ever Indian journalist to interview former Pakistan President Pervez Musharraf in January 2000 at a highly inflamed moment in India-Pakistan ties, taking place shortly after the hijacking of an Indian passenger aircraft to Kandahar, Afghanistan. 
She had a second interview with President Musharraf in 2002. She also did interviews of other top Pakistani leaders such as Ms. Benazir Bhutto Mr. and Mr. Nawaz Sharif and leading political figures in Sri Lanka such as the former president Dr. Chandrika Kumaratunga. She was the first journalist, first Indian journalist to interview Ms. Condoleezza Rice, former US National Security Advisor in the Bush administration and also was the first to interview Mr. Strobe Talbot, Deputy Secretary of State in the Clinton administration immediately after India's nuclear test and the subsequent US sanctions. Dr. Partha Sarthi completed her doctoral studies from the Center for Political uh, Studies, GNU, in 2008, and a master's degree in MS uh, in journalism from Graduate School of Journalism, Columbia University in 1982. After graduating from Columbia Journalism School, she worked briefly as the visiting journalist at the Washington Post before joining the Hindu. Currently, as the chairperson of the Hindu group of publications, she is actively steering a journey of digital transformation of the editorial products, particularly the Hindu, which now has a strong digital presence with an increasing subscriber base not limited to India. Her focus now is on ensuring that the publishing group establishes a leading presence in, a, in the new media territory without losing focus on the core business of printing and the imperative of maintaining the credibility and integrity of its journalistic offerings. She has received several awards and recognitions and I would like to name a few before wrapping up the introduction. She won the Pudhiya Talemurai Shakti Award for Leadership in 2018. In 2021, she was awarded the Sri Shankara TV Navashakti Award. She also um, won the Distinguished Alumni Award 2022 from the Columbia University Graduate School of Journalism. Uh, she was given the Haldi Ghati Award for Excellence in Journalism 1999-2000. Uh, These are to name a few. And with this, I conclude the introduction. Thank you so much. Thank you. With the spirit of enterprising journalists in mind, our guest speaker, Dr. Malini Parthasarathy, will be addressing us on the topic uh, retaining public trust in journalism in the digital aid age. Good afternoon, distinguished Pro Chancellor Dr. Balan, Dr. Padma Ghani, and a team friend, and uh, sorry, Dr. And, and the Registrar Pro Vice Chancellor as well, a team friend as well. It's an honor to be here to de deliver the MV Kamat Memorial Endowment Lecture, especially this year. Since this is the year of its centenary, I feel privileged to stand in this forum and in this institute that he so inspiringly created and to share my thoughts on journalism, which will set his life pattern and commitment. Is it clear? Mm. Sri Kamath was a legend, not only a prolific writer, he was said to be humble and grounded even as he's written so many guidebooks for journalists and reporters, drawing from his rich experience as reporter, foreign correspondent, and editor. His career reached great heights. He was chairman of Prasad Bhakti, longtime editor of the iconic Illustrated Weekly. But all this did not go to his head. With his self-deprecating humor and down-to-earth modesty, earned him legions of admirers, not only among journalists, but in public life. His strong sense of patriotism imbued his approach to acutely aware as he was, that he was witness to the unfolding of India's independent history. In an interview from the Institute of Communication, with I think one of your academic members, Dr. Nikhil Govind, published in the Hindu magazine in August 2013, just a year before his passing, Sri Kamath said, I'm quoting, he might well be the last person alive who actually reported Independence Day. Not just witness, but reporter. And I think uh, the, the writer said that Dr. Kamath's career, after all, mirrored the evolution of print journalism in independent India. So I think that's a major contribution. In the same conversation, 
the Vatican journalists remnant how in the immediate aftermath of independence, journalists were considered way down the professional ladder. So to quote him again, those days, no man would marry his daughter to a journalist. First the civil services, then the doctors and the lawyers, then the headmasters and the bank manager, then the policeman or the pune, and then maybe the journalist. The only today we felt were held in much better respect. Yet, cutting through the social prejudice for young Kamak was the call of the written word and the romance of the role of the foreign correspondent. He read the classic Edgar Snow, his book Red Town over China, his um, fascinating book, and it actually hypnotized him. And that beca began a career, an illustrious career that spanned continents and decades. He was one of the last giants who threw the landscape of journalism, and I think in a pre-digital age, understood that journalism in a sense was all about conveying accurately and un un uh, unerringly what transpired in words and action. While some of us, including myself, we disagreed with some of his political stances, especially with, as regards the Hindu the rise of militant Hindu nationalism, we did admire his strong adherence to journalistic values, integrity, his emphasis on rigor and reporting, his understanding of atmosphere and background in covering a news story, the importance of using anecdotes to illustrate the nuances of the situation, which really are important tools and valuable tools every journalism student needs to absorb going forward, and every journalist should remember. So now, with an entire generation of stalwarts in journalism like M.B. Kamath, Kuldeep Naya, Nikhil Chakravarti, and other stars having departed, it is striking that today journalism has very few voices to set standards and to call out their departures from the norms and values in our profession. What is really concerning today, and is really the subject of my lecture, is the pressure that the media and journalism face not only in India, but worldwide from the declining public trust in news media and journalism. It's a sad fact that over the decades, while digital technology has become a way of life, and is a principal disseminator of news content, public skepticism about news and the media organization is becoming much more pronounced. So as we all know, the proliferation of social media and platforms has a large role to play in fueling mistrust of content. And very often, social media commentators have a field day, pouncing on perceived errors or questionable judgments by columnists and reporters, hoping, of course, they have a vested interest according to me in such uh, you know, trawling, because they see that it would create a buzz on these platforms and put these people in the spotlight. Fortunately, various studies have been taking place recently, most notably the Reuters Institute for Journalism. They've been really studying this phenomenon very closely and intensely. India was added to the list of sub sub countries being surveyed post digital transformation. So they have found that while there's a very interesting paradox that came to the fore in their um, research, while there's considerable mistrust continuing to be generated, there's also strangely, as of this year, an increase in trust scores for legacy brands and public broadcasters in India. So the 2022 digital news report published by the Reuters Institute has specific um, surveys. This one um, examines how the news industry in different countries copes with the headwinds, quote unquote, particularly the continuing dominance of social media as a content disseminator. So I think I want to say a bit about the finding because it sets the context for understanding what's really happening, the relationship in terms of the relationship between news organizations and the public. This report finds that leading television brands are the most popular offline brands, with mostly English language, internet using survey respondents, and also equally popular are national newspapers. Also, print media has recovered from the pandemic slump, 
the overall reported revenue growth of 20% in 2021, including a strong bump from advertisement. Yet, legacy media platforms such as ours are facing stiff competition online from vibrant digital born brands that pursue independent journalism. The report finds that despite these brands having to rely on a non profit revenue model, mostly deriving support from grants and reader donations, the digital market too saw an overall growth of 29% in 2021, with advertising and subscription revenues growing at 29% each. The second very important feature and interesting, which was found about India, is that India is a strongly mobile-focused market, with 72% accessing news through smartphones and just 35% by computer. News aggregated platforms like and apps, like Google News, Daily Hunt, InShorts, and NewsPoint have become important ways to access news and are greatly valuable convenient. Social media are popular with a significant number in the surveyed audience using YouTube and WhatsApp. So this report found that India registered a small increase in news trust, improving its overall position among the politics market surveyed. Legacy print brands and public broadcasters like DD News, All India Radio, continue to enjoy high trust while 24-hour television channels are less well-trusted, along with newer digital bond brands. But what is clear, just, not just from the surveys, but the challenges that we face as news organizations and we see on the ground, ever since the rise of digital technology and social media proliferation, the nature and substance of news consumption by newer generations of users is substantively changing. Legacy brands like ours need to reckon with this rel relentless reality of digital technology becoming the main disseminative consumer content and thereby creating a connect with users. This in turn gives digital platforms the power to shape news content, to align with their preferences of the consumers. So what is, it means is a gap is widening between the old modes of journalism and the new media platform. It also erodes public trust in the news industry, with social media becoming appropriating for itself the role of arbiter of the trustworthiness and credibility of news content and content providers. In other words, the social media becomes a kind of arbiter of the quality of content disseminated by news organizations, which puts news organizations very often unnecessarily on the defensive. See, unlike in the past, you had target editors able to fascinate the reading public with their analysis and their punditry, and readers were drawn to editorialists and their judgments, and they savored the news reports and every page of the newspaper. But now we are faced with a very different kind of audience, young, aspirational, and also globally minded, who prefer to be informed and not educated. So um, um, they see education and pontification. So that's something that we legacy brands are coming to terms with that part of the role of, I mean, our own uh, work, which has been commentary, editorializing, giving opinions on, they're not as valued as before because the social media user feels empowered by, say that uh, 600, 600 characters, word limited, he or she can give their opinion equally freely. Another comprehensive by the survey by Reuters, again, the Institute of Journalism, this year, this summer, examined what they called the trust gap. So this report also had some interesting cleaning. And it, been, it had conversations with many publishers and journalists who felt that digital platforms were partly to blame for declining levels of trust in news in many places around the world. Some people actually worried that platforms enable, I'm going to quote, bad faith criticism of journalism to circle in more easily and insidiously, while polluting the information environment with low quality substitutes for factual reporting. Others saw platforms as undermining news audiences' connection with their 
even as they often saw digital media intermediaries as essential to reaching segments of the public least likely to turn into legacy mode as printed broadcast. See, that's the challenge to us. Because on one hand, we're aware that our, um, the, the print market is not what it used to be, especially past the pandemic. So we need to negotiate a cooperative relationship with the digital platforms. At the same time, not allowing them to take over our agenda or to dictate to us or to arbit, arbit, uh, be an arbiter of our content. The same trust gap survey found that negative perceptions about journalism are widespread. And social media is one of the most often cited places people say they see, see or hear criticism of news and journalism. And many half of the survey respondents said they believed journalists tried to manipulate audiences to serve the agenda of powerful politicians or care more about getting attention than reporting facts. In India, 58% of the respondents believe that journalists manipulate the agenda to serve powerful politicians. 50% care more about getting attention than reporting the facts. Platform users are more likely to say that they see criticism of journalists and news media often as compared to people who don't use platforms. So, the, so that the, the point is again, as a trade-off for expanding, um, is it clear? As a trade-off for expanding reach and scale, newsrooms have ceded considerable control to outside companies in terms of how their content is distributed. So this is further strain on the relationship because we are becoming increasingly dependent on digital platforms to establish our brand recognition while we also need to keep our legacy mode going. So the most, the, the, that problems are likely to be compounded in the company coming years by choices the platforms make about the prominence of news on their services when they go forward. But many of them have started announcing their intention to prioritize user-generated content. So where, where the, just to make it simple, even the old days, I mean, it was easy for us to set the agenda. So okay, this is the most important news development of the day. Our judgment prevailed as to what the readers saw, the users read or heard. Now we will need to see what comes on social media, what's the buzz on television, and what are people really interested in, if we need to retain our audiences. So this is the contradiction that we have to negotiate. So the Gaudi study says the strategies that these platforms are likely to adopt could reduce how frequently people are incidentally exposed to news from professional journalists working for media organizations when using the media platform in question. So this again uh, raises the same issues again. So the, according to the Gaudi survey, something which is common sense, it further underscores the importance of cultivating brand familiarity by connecting with audiences both offline and online. What we seek to do, for instance, we, we, put, we put in, some papers put in QR codes. Some of us act, actually just highlight, say, please go to our website for further in-depth reports on the same thing. So we are doing quite consciously this, building the connect between online and offline modes. But I think um, the, the, um, what we need to do is we can't just ignore the way that uh, our content is being seen on platform, nor can we completely depend on the basis of um, disseminating our news. Now, this, this phenomenon of digital disruption of the traditional business model of the news industry is happening worldwide, more pronounced and more so the United States. In fact, much more where I think the New York Times and others struggled at them and they went digital very quickly. It has only accentuated, unfortunately, the negative um, social trend of rising distrust in the media. As noted by a US NPR public editor in a lecture in 2017, this is relevant to us as well. Social media has made it far easier for individuals to express their doubts about stories and disseminate the opinion, they declaim more than they listen. They cherry pick facts to bolster their beliefs. Ideas gain momentum in a like-minded hive that assembles the online as consumers cluster in political thought bubbles, never having to confront an alternative view. 
to did virtually the ticket challenge placing this whole control over the selection of news content in the hands of the consumer is a serious challenge and this is now started happening in our media landscape. And I mean, this is what I, now I want to bring, bring it to a more important issue and equally concerning issue, what I would say is the elephant in the room. Yes, digital disruption and noisy social media do complicate, undermine the relationship with audiences. But the challenge worldwide, and in India in particular, has been the increasingly stressful pressure on the media and the public discourse by both government and political parties. And like in earlier term, times, when there was a discernible respect for the views of newspapers and ed editors, seen as contributing to a healthy public discourse, now there's an indifference on the part of public authority to the traditional media. Gone are the days when the government or <coughs> party spoke to get the vote. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm saying gone are the days when the government or party spokesperson were eager to engage the press in conversations about critical public policy issues. There's a clear tendency to bypass the mainstream media by communicating only through social media and radio, thereby not allowing the development of a healthy public discourse where accountability of public officials is a must. And I think social media, I think we all know, social media sites have become battlegrounds for, for contest, contestation between political parties, with the media very often a hapless protagonist in these unsavory propaganda wars, with their news content be used as cannon fodder for sparking new political controversy. And in the process, trying to take down the opposite political view, the media gets dragged into these controversies, sometimes lo losing its own sheen and its own gravitas. I need not emphasize enough that pressure on the media and undermining its role in the public space is dangerous for the health of our democracy. It's a matter of concern that while at independence, it was seen as axiomatic that the press as the fourth state was the respected pillar of India's new democratic state. Now the space for media to function freely and fearlessly as a watchdog has been greatly curtailed as a result of state action. The pressure on the press is both economic and legal. The former is the tactic of withholding government advertising, on which not so much we, but small newspapers depend for a significant part of their revenue, which is obviously a deterrent to fearless reporting. The second more visible is legal harassment, which states ruled by the BJP, and of course some opposition parties, West Bengal and uh, Telangana, Andhra Pradesh. Um, they often slap cases on journalists, invoking penal laws on uh, creating disharmony and conflict am among communities when you report communal clashes, and uh, especially when there are hate crimes against minorities. Even then, these penal provisions are introduced and to intimidate uh, people from reporting freely. During the COVID pandemic, Journalists who reported critically on oxygen shortages and overburdened hospitals were charged with creating panic. I, I would say one beacon of hope in the troubling period had been the Supreme Court. It had intervened frequently to protect journalists. And last May, which is a landmark ruling, I think we have a great Chief Justice just coming in now and hopefully he gives thought to it and we will see a landmark judgment soon. The court has suspended the operation, the sedition provision, after the Union government came forward under pressure to review the colonial era law that has over decades proven to be a deterrent to free speech. Sedition has been a major uh, colonial relic, and the government has been promising to repeal all colonial era legislation. So obviously, sedition will have to be a piece with that. Hopefully, Justice Chandrachit and others will take some, make a very definitive formulation on that. The court has also cast its eye on the new information technology rules framed by the union government in order to regulate inflammatory content and fake news on social media platforms. The rationale set out for this new set of rules was that, again I quote, 
Over the years, the increasing intensity of misuse of social media by criminals and in the national elements have brought new challenges for law enforcement agencies. These include inducement for recruitment of terrorists, circulation of obscene content, spread of disharmony, financial frauds, incitement of violence, public order. So there are certainly legitimate concerns that social platforms have become tools of abuse and misinformation and are harmful to national security. But the rules as such are a matter of concern for news publishers. Because in effect, the solution proposed is a problem. The redressal mechanism set up under the rules emphasizes three tiers of self-regulation, and it has its uh, ultimate uh, arbit of content on digital platforms and oversight mechanism by the government. Right now, it's still under process because there are various challenges in various state governments, uh, but the implication of such a mechanism, should it come to be, is disturbing. Because it proposes it will publish a charter for self-regulating bodies, including codes of practices, and the established an interdepartmental committee for hearing grievances on public platform content. Fortunately, it, it, the Supreme Court sees the matter, various high courts, the matter is pending. So to sum this up, thanks to a vigilant judiciary, the basic place for media to function freely remains un relatively unfettered. Even the surrounding political environment is daunting, and the approach to political authorities continues to be restrictive. So this is the background that I want to lay, lay out. So how do these developments actually going forward affect the relationship between the media and the public? So I've, um, again, just to summarize the three trends that I want you to keep in mind. The rise of digital technology and the disruptive effect, giving control to the platforms of, on content priorities and quality. Ascendancy the platforms setting their own news agenda with social media users feeling empowered as commentators. And the third very disturbing point, cultivated disregard by public officials and politicians for news media and journalists, enabled as they feel by the wide reach of social media and the rise of digital technology to bypass the media they communicated to the wider public. I'm not going to name the politicians, but I need to say the when I go to Delhi and I meet people in government, I'm not naming people, but there have been the assertion very often said that, oh, we don't really need you people anymore. We can go straight to TV and radio. The people are with us. We don't really need you. And, and then we have, you're, you're all so negative. So if that's the approach, then um, it's something that the media has to factor in into its response to see that we continue to serve as a watchdog. Unquestionably, there's a rise uh, in negativity as a result of all these three things. The way that politicians try to discredit exemplary work done by journalists, calling attention to deficits in governance or deviation in policies. But as the fortunate uh, surveys like the Reuters have shown, the, the general public still trust legacy brand, brands and broadcasters to, re to report news and developments, and they also are a little bit wary of social media platforms. That's why I said it's paradoxical. On one hand, they want them for the news content, to feed in news content, and at the same time for reliability, credibility, and accuracy, I think they still lean on legacy brands and public broadcasters, and they see that social media are, are likely purveyors of misinformation and fake news. But earlier, the media could be confident of, you know, maintain, just maintaining editorial standards and just adhering to core principles of reporting truthfully and showing fairness and transparency would be enough to stand you in good stead with your audience. So it's very difficult to overcome this. And my final question, does a rapidly changing media environment presage the fading away of tra traditional news media and the ebbing of the glamour of journalism and journalists, particularly relevant to you all here. And I would like to reassure you, the answer is a categorical no. 
A subtle characteristic of the post digital society is the abundance of unregulated news content on platforms. Is that consumer looking for verified and factually correct information will still seek out credible sites of such information? I, I, I don't know if you're all familiar, but there's this classic handbook by Bill Kovacs and Tom Rosenstiel. So the, 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 the book is The Elements of Journalism which has been updated to um, deal with what the rise of digital technology. It identifies the essential principles and practice of journalism that ought to be upheld going forward. I'm quoting them. As citizens encounter an ever greater flow of data, they have more need, not less need, for supplies of information dedicated to finding and verifying the news and putting that news in context. So this indeed is our job today. If we want to save the core essence of journalism, which I think is one of the world's noblest professions, dedicated to the well-being of our society, whether to inform or to entertain or to warn or to call out. So as Kovacs and Rosenstiel underline, the news publisher, whether it's a media corporation, are able to advertisers and shareholders or bloggers with their own personal beliefs and priorities must show an ultimate allegiance to citizens. To quote them, technology might may change, but trust when earned and nurtured will endure. We must ensure that we are not ostriches in the sand and we are on top of uh, the rapidly changing technology environment. We should be in we should function the latest tools of digital technology engage intelligently with media platforms, ensure that our brands stay connected with our audience online and offline. But again, to be very, I mean, honest, I think that if we consistently continue to uphold our editorial standards, particularly emphasize core journalistic tools, verification, transparency, honesty, these are not just uh, pious uh, truisms. I mean, these are meant to be practical and when you're writing you actually need to see that it's not an absolute truth but a truth as you see it on the ground you're not meant to be objective and you must recognize your lack of objectivity i think that too often do we confuse objectivity and truth with some absolute standards that i don't think any normal person journalism is history in the making and people have said so my point is that it's more honest to recognize our biases I'm more honest to say that there's no absolute truth. There's a truth that we see, and the only best way you can do it is by diversity, a multiplicity of sources, making sure that um, you're, you're hearing as many voices as possible. If we do all that, and editing and reporting, the another casualty of the, the rise of digital technology, been the, I mean, I'm, we are guilty too, elimination of copy editors, what they used to call sub editor. So that leading to a lot of errors. Even when we take agency photographs and the news items, very often we make slips which uh, you get pounced upon and trolling, where you just by mistake you don't edit closely. So I think if we stick with this, we will be providing um, quality content to our audiences who, who will appreciate them. And we should also acknowledge that. We should be, be gracious, acknowledge the tremendous advance by digital platforms, respect them as powerful content disseminators, keep updating our techniques of storytelling, expand our imagination in the presentation of our content. I think we will uh, really, by virtue of why, reach to our audiences in the democratic society. I think it's our duty to hold public officials accountable, but not be overly pessimistic about the pace of transformation. I'd like to thank the Academy, the Institute, for giving me this wonderful opportunity to share my thoughts on this important topic and in memory of a journalistic legend, M.B. Kamat. Thank you all for staying so long and listening. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, we are now open for a cursory Q&A session. But because we are also suffering from the dearth of time, we're going to keep it short and crisp. So I'll be just reading two of the questions posed by our students. The first one being, as students in the current media scenario, we are preparing for the challenges that we are going to face in the profession. What are your suggestions, ma'am? I think I've uh, mentioned that in my lecture. 
that going forward, you need to be optimistic. First of all, you should be sure that there's a wonderful career as a journalist. Secondly, I think we should not abandon the traditional and, and I would say optimistic visionary way of look, most of us, I mean, including the Hindu and including all of us, come to journalism because we see it as a public service. And we are enthused by the opportunity to, you know, speak for society and, and uh, be a boss down. So I would think continue to please uh, keep those values, but be aware that you can't uh, gratitude that technology is changing rapidly. And to being a journalist today is not the old way of, as I just said in my lecture, it, it's not enough to just pontificate anymore. We have to be more, we have to be a storyteller rather than any kind of, uh, I mean, no other. I think the role of a storyteller is what a journalist needs to remember. Okay, ma'am. The second question is, it seems that public interest journalism on the whole is diminishing over the years. What are your suggestions, madam, to re-establish this kind of journalism broadly? Uh, public interest journalism. Um, I would think all journalism in public interest. So the old days of you know, saying public interest journalism. I think nowadays that's exactly what I mean, that it's become outmoded. I think some of the concepts we used to see earlier, development journalism, public interest journalism, this is my own opinion, not to discredit legitimate fields of study. Me as a journalist and publisher would think that these are a bit obsolete to assume that journalism, all journalism is for the public interest. But it, public interest includes entertaining and it includes appreciating your reader or user has the right to know what he or she wants. Thank you, ma'am, for lending us insight on various topical points. On the same note, as a token of our appreciation, I request Dr. Narayan Sabahit, Registrar Mahe, to present Dr. Malini with a memento. We now duly arrive at the point of closure for which I call upon Dr. Padma Kumar, HOD Corporate Communication to dole out the vote of thanks. I deem it a great honor and privilege to propose a vote of thanks on this memorable occasion. First and foremost, I would like to thank Dr. Malini Parthasarathy, Chairperson, the Hindu Publishing Group and Director Editorial Strategy who graciously accepted our invitation and found time to grace this event despite her busy schedule. We adore you, ma'am, for reviving the legacy of the Hindu. Heartfelt thanks to Dr. H.S. Balal, our Pro Chancellor, for his able guidance, vision, support, and guidance. I thank our registrar, Dr. Narayan Sabahit, for his unstinted support for this event. We are grateful to Udayavani, the Manipal Group, for their valuable contribution. My heartfelt thanks to the university officials of MAHE, HOIs of various institutions, and faculty members for their guidance and encouragement in all our efforts. I thank the members of the media for evincing interest in covering this event. Special thanks to Hotel Fortune in Valley View for their cooperation and service. We owe special gratitude to the audio-visual department of MAHE for the coverage of the event. Thank you all. Thanks for joining us. Thank you one and all. We now come to an absolute close of the event.